afternoon. Uh, I will discuss some of the findings of a PICARI funded research project entitled Chemical and Environment Portable Sensor Technologies. The, uh, my collaborators here are from the National Institute of Physics. This is Dr. Samin Tak and Dr. Elmer Estacio. And our partner is from University of California, Berkeley, is at the, with the Mechanical Engineering Department. It's Professor Li Wei Lin. Uh, next slide, please. So graphene field effect transistors as gas sensors were fabricated with sensitivities as low as one part per million for ammonia, nitrogen dioxide, and methanol. The fabricated devices had an active area of at least 40 uh, micron square. And the studies indicate that the sensitivity was enhanced with the deposition of a thin layer of palladium on top of the graphene. Also, when you look at the response of the device, the, the device is sensitive to the uh, size of the chamber. So there is an effect of the transient response. And as part of my talk, uh, during the course of this work, it was important to see how the other research institutes in the Philippines work hand in hand towards accomplishing this goal. We have the next slide, please. So, the aim of this work is to come up with wearable, low power, and low cost devices based on the graphene platform. What I'm showing to you, uh, Mark, there the photo of an actual device. That's just that 25 cent coin that we have. Now, actually, that device, you have easily 16 devices inside that. So it's really, really small. And uh, when we talk about low cost, one of the primary considerations is that the fabrication process should be compatible with semiconductor manufacturing process. Because again, you're going to be making millions of this and you have to have control of the uniformity of the device and, and, and uh, the semiconductor processing process is very good at that. Now, the application of this one is a device can be incorporated in smartphones and smart watches. Uh, one application that we're thinking of is with the sensor in the, G in, in the cell phones, then as we, we can have real-time monitoring of the environment as the workforce moves in the morning to, the, to their office and then from their office to their homes in the evening. So that is possible if we have this device. Uh, next slide, please. Now, graphene has many, many interesting properties, but I'd like to focus on one feature that allowed us to make these sensitive devices. So it's very nice to know that most of my students are here. Um, graphene is a zero band gap uh, material, and no, often it is uh, the band structure is this is depicted by that conical structure where the Dirac point, that's where the two cones meet. And uh, the energy dispersion of graphene the, is linear in K. Now, coupled with the fact that it's a two-dimensional object, then the density of states will also be linear in K. So that's shown in the uh, 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 triangular figure. Now, the property of a material, especially its transport property, is determined by how many carriers are there it, at the Fermi level. If you have, for example, a, a figure A, you are able to dope graphene such that the Fermi level is way above the Dirac point, then you would have many carriers. Or if you dope it the P type, then the Fermi level is below the Dirac point, and then you'll also have many carriers there. The doping can be done when you have absorbates on the graphene, they either donate an electron from graphene to graphene or they remove an electron to the graphene. Now, those working in field effect transistor technology, they know that there is another way where you can actually control the Fermi level. Next slide, please. And this is by in an metal oxide semiconductor structure, the Fermi level 
can be controlled by applying the appropriate gate bias. So what we have here at the bottom figure is the schematic diagram of the device structure. It consists of a silicon substrate, which is heavily doped, and that becomes the metal. Then you have silicon dioxide, and then on top of that is the graphene material, which now becomes the channel. In contrast, for normal silicon CMOS, what you have is the channel is between the silicon dioxide and silicon interface. But here, because the silicon is heavily doped, it doesn't behave like a semiconductor. The silicon here behaves like a metal. And the channel is now on top, and that's the graphene layer. So we would put the source and drain contacts on top of the graphene channel. Now, how do we control or how do we move the Fermi level? If you apply, if you sweep the gate voltage, it is possible then to move it, move the Fermi level below the Dirac point where there are lots of carriers that would translate to uh, resistivity, which is low. Now, as you pass to the Dirac point, the number of carriers is going to be very, very small. So now the resistivity is going to be high. Going further past the Dirac point into the conduction band, now you have the Fermi level above the Dirac point, and then you go back to lots of carriers, and then the resistivity is going to go down again. So this is how we are able to determine at what bias voltage would the graphene channel uh, have the Fermi level at the Dirac point. Now, during fabrication, there is always an issue, do we have graphene or do we have another bilayer? So one way of doing that is to look at the Raman spectra of the layer. So what I have shown here would be, you see on the right figure, there's a green dot, that's the laser hitting the graphene portion of the device. And if you look at the Raman spectra, We've done it here at NIP and also at Berkeley, that yes, this is indeed graphene. So next slide. So how do we operate this device? The trick there is to operate at the Dirac point. When the applied bias is near the Dirac point, the graphene will have lower carrier concentration, any additional doping, and also because of the uh, absorbents coming there, uh, in additional charge impurity scattering will be seen. So the sensitivity is enhanced. Far from the Dirac point, any additional cares that come there will not be detected because you have so much cares already, the conductivity is high, so it will not be seen. So the key for this device is to operate it at the Dirac point. Next slide. So this is uh, how the fabrication process uh, is done for this, for this transistor. Initially, when the project started, we had to lift off. The graphene was grown on another material. Then we have to remove it and then transfer it to the silicon-silicon dioxide uh, substrate. And this is the standard epitaxial liftoff process. Later on, we were able to have uh, the graphene grow directly on the silicon dioxide. So once you have the graphene there, then the, the next process would be to define the metal contacts. We do this so that we can anchor the graphene film into the silicon dioxide. That's a standard lithography process. So at the end of that, you have those yellow bars that represents the metal contacts. But then the entire layer is still covered with graphene. So the next step is to isolate the device and that would mean using either uh, plasma etching to remove the unwanted portions of the graphene. And finally, you have the device. So what we've shown here would be images of the device. They have dimensions of 40 uh, microns. So in a 1 cm graphene sample, we can easily make 16 devices, and then cut them into four, and then one portion will be bonded, that's four devices shown on the lower right portion of the figure. So you have four devices there, 
the graphene itself, the device is so small. It's just that the metal contacts occupy so much space, and but that can be reduced. Next slide, please. So again, that, that shows you how the footprint of the sensor, and it could be further reduced if we have smaller metal contacts. And ideally, in, in semiconductor industry, the metal contact should be, uh, can easily be 40 microns also, a small also as the graphene device. So next slide. Okay, at the start of the project, we were not working with graphene. We were working with three, five semiconductors. So we had to go to Berkeley to see how they do the fabrication and then how they do the measurements. So what I've shown on the left would be pictures of um, the equipment there at the Marvel lab in Berkeley. And the one on the right is the equipment we have at NIP. If you look at, you compare the left and the right, they're almost similar. We do have the same photolithography tools. We have the same metal deposition, except that we had to know how they were handling the machines. That's why we had to go to Berkeley. In the end, we were able to set up our gas sensing facility, which can be used not only for uh, our work, but uh, those who are interested in gas sensors. Next slide. So this is a big image, a picture of the gas sensing facility that we have put up at NIP. Again, it's open for collaboration. Those who would like to work on gas sensing can also use this facility. We have the high purity gases in stock and then the mass flow controller to regulate the flow rate. Then it goes to the chamber. The chamber has to be designed right. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there will be transient effects and then you have the control electronics to, uh, to have the proper bias and, and the proper measurement. Next slide, please. So this is the initial result that we got. Uh, the one, concentrate the one on the left. So where, where we turn on the, mass, the gas uh, indicated by that uh, magenta box. So for humidity, we turn it on and then yes, the, the sensor responds very nicely, we turn it off, and then it goes back to its original reading. However, when we work with the gases that we wanted to, uh, that's ammonia, NO2, and uh, methane, uh, we had a hard time. We, yes, we know that they are responding. There's a change in the resistivity once we turn on the gases, but then it does not recover as fast like in the humidity sensor and there's some drips. Next slide. So there were problems, initial problems that we have. Uh, the sensor responds fast to humidity but suffer long recovery times for other gases. It does not go back to its original value and the size of the chamber may be affecting the response time. Uh, next slide please. One of the researcher here, uh, Lorenzo Lopez worked and did, did a simulation so we were initially working with a gas chamber the size of a 250 ml beaker. That's relatively large. Eventually we said, well, it takes so long for it to stabilize. So what happened is we have to make a smaller, smaller chamber. And then the simulations also uh, took into effect the flow and how much flow rate we can actually put into this chamber. And that, that result was published in uh, an Elsevier uh, publication. But yes, the chamber size actually plays a major role in measuring the decay time. So we have to be wary of that when we do gas sensing work, especially when we go to the PPM level. Next slide, please. So the next thing we did is how do we improve this? Uh, we did uh, deposit a thin layer of palladium, thin, we think it's less than 10 nanometers, maybe less than maybe less than 80 Armstrongs. And we see a better response. Again, for humidity, there is no problem. We turn on the, 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 the air containing water, it responds perfectly. But now with ammonia, we could clearly see the response. There is still a problem with the recovery time. This plot shows 
three parts per million down to one part per million. So we can at least see there is a difference in response of one part per million and three parts per million for ammonia. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, we can detect ammonia at 50 ppm. So this is below the uh, what the nose can detect. Same thing happens also with uh, CH3OH. We can di distinctly see a difference between 3 ppm down to versus 1 ppm. But there is still a problem with the recovery for these devices. I think we could solve that if we just place a heater with the device. So adding this thin layer of palladium improves the performance of the device. We still have work to do and trying to figure out exactly how it's done. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, this has to do with the response time, again, when you have with water, but that's the same thing. We've got an improvement with the palladium in it. Next slide. So for the summary of the performance of the device, uh, we were able to deliver or to get at least less the sensitivity is down to below 10 ppm. Uh, for ammonia, it was you can easily see a 1 ppm detection, uh, not saving water and CH3OH. Next slide. Now, how is this work possible? I'd like to list down or acknowledge the hard work done by the students. And this is where the synergy comes in. Most of the students did not get their undergraduate degree from NIP. Uh, Regine Libertaros actually came from USC, San Carlos. Uh, we have two guys there who got their degree from PUP and then from UP Baguio. Uh, Jam Pangasinan was working on carbon nanodots or carbon nanotubes when she joined our group. And then uh, Roger Madula came from MSU IIT. So this is a diverse group coming from different backgrounds and it actually helped in making this project work because we were able to get inputs from different fields. I mean, Lorene Ballesteros she is actually a chemist by training. Uh, next slide, please. So we were able to do this work because the students um, had prior training before the PICARIS project. Uh, this involved device fabrication. They, we had the laboratory for device fabrication, except we were working on a different material. So when they went to Berkeley, they saw the same machines, except it was going to be on graphene. They just have to be a bit more careful. But what I'd like to point out is that uh, you need a broad support of institutions across the country to have a vibrant graduate school. The students is not going to go come from one source. It's going to come from many sources. And SPP has grown. Uh, um, over the past so many years, I was happy to know that we have contributions from Batangas State University. CLSU has developed a lab. It would be very nice to, to work with them. Still, the other institutions, some are small, they may need support so that we will have a vibrant graduate school. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, the next thing I'd like to stress is, is the success of the project actually stand because we were grounded on fundamental basic cutting edge research and that allows us to venture into other fields. There has been talk recently that uh, we have to go to applied work, applied research, but then we will be blindsided if we focus too much on that. Look at the what we have done before, we were working on field effect transistors on gallium arsenide, uh, modfets, and this th that paper there, the one on the lower right, that's a paper as far as 2002. But because we were working on that material, it allowed us to easily move to graphene field effect transistors. We were working on pet action lift off uh, method, not for practical purposes, but we would like to 
uh, study the strait. So it was a fundamental interest, basic science interest, or so called what people call cutting edge. Thanks, Apo. Okay, so given that, uh, next slide, please. So we, I'd like to thank uh, Picari and also uh, OBCRD for allowing us to finish this project and uh, collaborators. For three, uh, I would like to thank to the organizer for inviting me to this conference. And uh, <clears throat> so the title of my talk uh, today is uh, study, Studies for Enhancing Terrace Emission uh, from Optical optically excited spintronic films. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, the related presentation was made by uh, Ms. Tarara uh, in the previous session. And this uh, talk will compensate uh, his presentation. The collaborator in this work are uh, uh, National Institute of Material uh, Science and also uh, Osaka University and the Saga University. Uh, uh, be, uh, to begin with the uh, this presentation, I firstly I'd like to uh, you know also thank to the uh, uh, Philippine Japan collaborations. So um, we had a uh, very long term and uh, very active collaboration uh, uh, between uh, Philippine and Japan with uh, Kobe University and. Uh, our UPD and NIP, and uh, also uh, Little South University. And uh, this cooperation includes uh, our DOS, JSPS, Bilateral Joint Research Program, and uh, uh, MOA or MOU, uh, each other, and uh, Visiting Professor Program, and the Overseas Student uh, you know, uh, Education Program, and so on. So, um, uh, sorry, I, I just uh, missed to mention about the UP, uh, contribution of UPLB. Uh, okay, so um, the topic uh, of my talk today is uh, about the uh, spintronic heterostructure and the trust emission from uh, such structure. Uh, there was a uh, you know, first demonstration of trust emission from, from spintronic heterostructures uh, from our JAMA group in 2013. So uh, this, uh, you know, emission is very uh, interesting, you know, uh, because it utilizes spin current, you know, uh, conversion of spin current to charge current by using inverse spin hole effect or inverse Nashiba Edelstein effect. Uh, this third emitter has many advantages, uh, such as it can give us very broadband trust emission up to 30 terahertz. And the trust emission projection is tunable by changing the uh, magnetic field bias. Uh, actually, the structure of the device is very simple and very robust. And uh, it, it's, uh, you know, damage ratio is very high. That means uh, it has very high power scalability. And, uh, uh, it is actually low cost. However, there is a problem. Uh, the trace emission efficiency is relatively low. So uh, the uh, motivation uh, of our research is, you know, um, uh, uh, coming from you know this uh, low trace emission efficiency of this uh, spintronic trace emitter. Uh, so let me explain uh, the principle of trust emission um, by using uh, inverse spin hole uh, effect. So uh, imagine that you have thin ferromagnetic uh, metal and adjacent to that non ferromagnetic metal, and we pump a uh, film second optical pass on the ferromagnetic metal. Then we can launch our spin uh, current. Uh, because our, you know, uh, under the magnetic field, uh, the electron is polarized, then uh, spin polarized, and it uh, uh, super diffuses uh, to adjacent non-ferromagnetic metal 
uh, because they gain our kinetic energy by optical pumping. And in the uh, non ferromagnetic metal, uh, the uh, spin polarized current actually, uh, you know, uh, create a real current uh, because spin up and spin down uh, electron are diffracted to the opposite direction of each other that will generate a real charge current. And uh, this current is, you know, very short and transient. Then uh, this current emit uh, trailhead past radiation to uh, free space. Okay. Um, so um, we want to enhance this terrestrial emission from the spintronic emitter. So uh, this is a list of the factor we have to consider. So firstly, we have to choose an appropriate ferromagnetic and non-magnetic metal pair. And this is a, a, these are a list uh, for the uh, metallic pair uh, so far investigated. And uh, we choose an uh, iron and the platinum pair because uh, uh, so far uh, this, this is the most efficient, you know, a spintronic uh, terrestrial emitter so far we have investigated. And uh, uh, actually, uh, their test emission efficiency is largely dependent on the metallic flame quality. Uh, that means we should use a high quality of uh, metal, and it should be a uh, crystalline. And uh, uh, usually, we use our epitaxial uh, growth technique for fabrication of these films. And also, the thickness of metal film also um, does matter. So uh, it should be uh, not too thick, or and also it not should be uh, very thin. So we have to optimize uh, the thickness of each uh, metal pair. For example, for the case of iron and platinum heterostructure, uh, uh, this thickness of iron two nanometer and platinum three nanometer is the most optimum condition for trace emission. And you also have to uh, choose their pumping wavelengths to get optimized charge emission. But uh, uh, later on, I will detail about the uh, uh, pump wavelength dependence. And uh, uh, lastly, we can uh, engineer their structure or shape of the uh, spin drag emitter. So far, um, multi-layered or tandem structure of a spin uh, emitter is reported. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to forecast uh, some, uh, you know, shaped antenna structure. So um, what uh, the uh, device structure we use in this work is illustrated here. So we have our ion film on uh, magnesium oxide substrate and uh, on top of it, we also um, make a platinum thin layer. And the thickness of this layer is like this, uh, three nanometer platinum and a two nanometer uh, iron. And we use from second layer for pump optical pumping. Then um, we apply uh, uh, some magnetic field uh, in this direction, uh, normal to the surface. And to couple out the uh, trust emission, we also use a hyper hemispherical silicon band. So by using this structure, uh, we can we have investigated our wavelength dependence of the trust emission efficiency. So this here shows the uh, you know uh, wavelength dependence uh, from 700 nanometer to to 2,700 nanometer. The upper figure shows that, uh, you know, uh, dependence on wavelengths scale. And this one shows the uh, uh, efficiency uh, per pump power. Uh, so, uh, you know, their dependence is not so significant between this uh, 700 to, to uh, around two micrometer. So this is good news because we can either use, uh, you know, 800 nanometer tie stuff later or uh, 1.55 uh, communication wavelength fiber laser. 
And uh, uh, it is not shown here, but uh, we also tested at 400 nanometer, and we can get uh, uh, almost the same efficiency also at uh, 400 nanometer. And if we plot this delta uh, for, uh, you know, uh, per photon energy, the efficiency actually decreases, uh, uh, you know, with increasing wavelengths. That means uh, energetic photon uh, should have more higher efficiency, okay? So um, from this result, just we can say that, uh, you know, we, you can choose any wavelengths uh, in this, you know, uh, visible to IR range. But if you uh, go up to, you know, uh, very long wavelengths such as the two or three nanometer micrometer, you lose the efficiency. Okay, then uh, I would like to explain our, the, their antenna uh, structure. So antenna has their mainly two functions. One is to improve the outcoupling efficiency of the uh, radiation to free space. Another function is uh, uh, of antenna is you know that improve detectivity or detective gain. That means you know you can change the uh, you know radiation pattern of the antenna. In the uh, recent report by JAMA Group, uh, they used our HF antenna and they reported, uh, you know, enhancement of 2.45 times terrestrial emission efficiency of this uh, structure of spintronic uh, emitter. So uh, what we have done is, you know, uh, we are prepared uh, these types of shapes for antenna, circle shaped, uh, you know, uh, uh, spintronic emitter and rectangular shaped and diablo shaped, and also are uh, diablo shaped uh, but with thicker antenna arms. So we investigated uh, these antenna structure and shapes by using uh, this, you know, uh, layer structure. So uh, this is a structure of uh, circle shaped uh, of platinum ion spintronic emitter. The diameter of the circle is 100 micrometer and uh, are laid with uh, 200 micrometer, uh, you know, uh, separation. And the layer structure is as shown here. Then uh, for rectangular shaped, uh, uh, it has uh, four, four 40 micrometer and uh, uh, 100 micrometer uh, dimension. And then we uh, fabricated a uh, diablo shaped or bow tie shaped uh, uh, you know, platinum ion spintronic emitter uh, like this. The uh, actual length uh, is two nanometer and the width is 1.2 millimeter, uh, millimeter. And uh, uh, this uh, waist width is uh, 50 micrometer. And uh, this works as a emitting antenna. Okay, so uh, this is your uh, Experimental setup of our terahertz time domain spectrometer. So we use a titanium sapphire laser with a wavelength of around at around 800 nanometer, and it pumps the, our uh, spin drink emitter. And then uh, emitted radiation is detected by our hot conductive antenna detector. And by uh, changing the uh, you know uh, delay of these are uh, in you know, pump and uh, probe beams. And then we can get a terahertz waveform from these, uh, you know, from the uh, spintronic terahertz emitter. This is typical terahertz uh, TDS uh, setup. So this is the result. You can see that the uh, waveform of, uh, uh, you know, of terahertz pulse uh, from unshaped spintronic emitter and diablo and circular and rectangular. So the amplitude of the emission is increasing with this order. And uh, uh, actually your Diablo-shaped uh, 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 emitter does not have not so much emission uh, enhancement. Uh, circular and rectangular is better. And, but uh, the enhancement is not so large because uh, we think that uh, uh, there are uh, this emitter uh, shape does not work uh, properly as antenna because the uh, antenna uh, part is too thin to work as a metallic antenna. 
That's why we fabricated our thick arm diable shaped antenna like this. So central part is the uh, thin uh, spintronic uh, you know, layer as it was, but uh, uh, the, uh, the triangular arm is covered 100 nanometer platinum and uh, uh, this uh, thickness is uh, more than enough to work as a bulk metallic uh, you know, antenna. So uh, central part width is eight micrometer and we pump all this part. And then for, uh, uh, this worked as a current source of this antenna structure. Okay, this is the result. Uh, you can see that uh, simply uh, we can get uh, uh, about two times enhancement by thick diaper antenna compared to unshift one. So this means, uh, okay, uh, and in addition to that enhancement of amplitude, we can see that change of the uh, waveform, uh, the way pulse width is enlarged. Okay, and also this is a, a spectrum uh, distribution. You can see that the enhancement is mainly coming from the lower frequency below one terahertz region. So this is actually a typical behavior of the large size, the large size terahertz antenna. That means our, our Diablo sick antenna is working properly as an uh, antenna. So uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, what we had. So let me summarize uh, what we learned from uh, these our studies. So uh, uh, good news is that uh, we can use our uh, pump wavelengths in a very broad range that is from uh, visible around 400 nanometer uh, to IR up to uh, uh, 2007 nanometer. And uh, uh, by changing our, uh, you know, uh, just shaped structure, uh, by using shaped structure, you can get uh, some enhancement. But to get, you know, a really good enhancement, you have to have a thicker antenna structure that is coupled to the spintronic uh, current source. And then, uh, uh, so, uh, these are a uh, message uh, I can, uh, you know, uh, transfer to you today. And the whole future, we are planning to have a uh, discharge emission, uh, you know, uh, to apply uh, to the magnetic optical sensor or imaging as illustrated in their, uh, you know, presentation by, uh, you know, Nidia Tarara uh, 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 in the previous session. So uh, lastly, I'd like to thank you to other uh, collaborator uh, helping us. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ivan Cedric Verona, a member of the CMPL Semicon Group. And today I will be presenting our work the titled Spintronic Terahertz Emission of Nickel platinum on gas using 150 nanometer fiber laser. So first, a short intro to terahertz. So what is terahertz radiation? So terahertz radiation refers to the um, region of uh, electromagnetic spectrum with a frequency of 0 0.1 to 10 terahertz. Um, it is located in the middle of the infrared and microwave regions. So, terahertz radiation has its uses in a variety of applications, including the field of medicine, agriculture, forensics, sem and semiconductor processing. So, um, terahertz radiation can be generated using semiconductors such as indium arsenide and gallium arsenide, or uh, through the use of uh, fabricated devices like uh, photoconductive antennas, or PCAs for short. Um, but in this work, uh, the terahertz emitter we will uh, we used is a spintronic device which makes use of electron spins to generate terahertz radiation. Uh, the spintronic emitter consists of a, a non-magnetic and ferromagnetic thin, thin film heterostructure. Uh, spintronic emitters makes use of the inverse pinhole effect which converts a spin resolved current JS to a real current JC. In the inverse pinhole effect, a ferromagnetic layer, FM, is magnetized parallel to its surface. 
the magnetization can either be oriented uh, as B up or B down. The a femtosecond pulse uh, excites electrons in the uh, ferromagnetic metal into spin polarized states, spin up or spin down, which um, then super diffuse into the uh, non-magnetic layer. Spin orbit coupling deflects the spin up and spin down electrons into opposite directions uh, with a mean angle gamma. As they enter the uh, non-magnetic layer, the deflection of the spin up and spin down electrons induces a transient charge current, which is the source of the terahertz radiation. This is the uh, JC. So the real current JC is characterized by the equation by equation one. Uh, wherein uh, JC is equal to gamma times um, the cross product of JS and sigma. Sigma is the um, uh, magnetization vector, so it is parallel to the direction of the magnet. The spintronic emitter consists of a gas substrate with a 50 nanometer thick nickel layer deposited on top, then capped with a 6 nanometer thick uh, platinum layer. The nickel layer serves as the ferromagnetic material while the platinum layer serves as the non-magnetic mater non -magnetic material. A silicon hyperhemispherical lens is attached to the gas substrate side to collimate the emitted terahertz. A standard terahertz TDS setup in transmission geometry was used for this, uh, for this work. The laser source is a Menlo C fiber femtosecond laser which emits uh, 100 femtosecond pulses at a frequency of 100 megahertz. The laser power that reaches the sample is about 40 milliwatts and the magnetic field strength is about 20 millitesla. The Menlo fiber laser has two outputs, a 1550 uh, nanometer output and a 780 nanometer output. The 780 nanometer output is used to uh, power the uh, PCA detector while the 1.550 nanometer is used to uh, excite the spintronic emitter sample. For the results and discussion, uh, figure 1a shows the terahertz emission at 1.550 uh, nanometer excitation. Uh, so the, it can be observed that the TDS waveform uh, is uh, becomes inverted when the B field direction is reversed. That is, uh, the TDS waveform changes uh, when uh, the orientation of the B field changes from B up to B down. This is consistent with the uh, inverse pinhole effect uh, because, as shown earlier, the uh, real current JC is dependent upon the direction of the magnetization. Figure 1b shows the terahertz emission at 780 nanometers. Uh, it was observed that no change in the waveform happens upon uh, B-field reversal. Uh, this is attributed to the um, uh, terahertz from uh, the gallium arsenide uh, dominates uh, compared to the contribution of the spintronic emitter. Uh, figure 2a shows the uh, FFT spectra at 1550 nanometer excitation. So uh, we can see that the uh, uh, signal to noise ratio is only about two orders above the noise level. Whereas in figure 2b, the FFT spectra at 780 nanometer excitation, the uh, SNR is about five orders above the noise level. Uh, this is uh, due to the much higher. Uh, signal levels for the 780 nanometer excitation. So in summary, the spintronic terahertz emission was successfully observed under 1550 nanometer excitation of the nickel and platinum on GA sample. The polarity of the terahertz signal reverses with magnetic field orientation which is consistent with the inverse pinhole effect. And at 780 nanometer excitation, the terahertz generation is dominated by 
the gallium, ar gallium arsenide contribution. Uh, our results may pave the way for hybrid ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic and non-magnetic metal bilayers and semiconductors for terahertz spintronic optoelectronic devices. We would like to thank the following for their support in this work. And that will be the end of the presentation. Thank you everyone for your uh, kind attention. Good day everyone. My name is Dean Von Johari Narag. I'm going to talk about our SPP paper entitled Terror Emission from MBE Grown Indium Gallium Arsenide on Indium Phosphide and Indium Arsenide on Gallium Antimonide Films Excited by 1550 Nanometer Femtosecond Laser Pulses. Here is an outline of my talk. Firstly, I'm going to give a background on terror radiation, why it is an object of interest, and how it can be generated. Next, I'm going to briefly mention a few basics on molecular beam epitaxy growth technique. Then, we are going to proceed to the results. And finally, we end with a summary. Terror radiation, as its name suggests, is a type of electromagnetic radiation in the terahertz frequency range. That is, it is between the infrared and microwave uh, radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum. That's typically around 100 gigahertz to 30 terahertz. It is an interesting subject area because of its potential applications in medical and biological sciences, information and communications, and security, as in airport or home security. Among the ways to generate terror radiation is through optical excitation. Here, we are going to talk about two types of optical generation of terror radiation. The first of the two is by the surface depletion field. This phenomenon is apparent in semiconductors with a wide band gap where the surface bands or surface states lie within its energy gap. This leads to band bending and formation of a depletion region through a built-in electric field. After optical excitation, the photocarriers are accelerated in the opposite directions, forming a surge current where the terahertz radiation arises. The second one, the photodember effect, is more apparent in small uh, band gap semiconductors. It describes the generation of charge carriers via ultrafast photo excitation, for example, by using femtosecond laser pulses. This induces a charge dipole within the material. Generally, the electrons have a higher mobility so they can diffuse further away from the surface of the semiconductor compared to the holes. This charge separation builds up the diffusion current which generates the terahertz radiation. Typically, the laser used as an excitation source for terahertz generation is a titanium sapphire laser with wavelength equal to 800 nanometers. Unfortunately, this is bulky and expensive. In response to that, we aim to investigate different semiconductor heterostructure designs that can be excited using low-cost and compact 1,550 nanometer femtosecond lasers, which can be an alternative to the titanium sapphire excited sources. The two heterostructures that we investigated in this paper are the indium gallium arsenide on indium phosphide and indium arsenide on gallium antimonide films. Both heterostructures were grown using molecular beam epitaxy. Molecular beam epitaxy or MBE is a growth technique similar to vapor deposition but in a highly controlled and at an ultra high vacuum environment. The solid source materials are evaporated in the effusion cells forming a molecular beam which are then allowed to chemically interact on a heated substrate. By controlling the flux ratios and temperature of the sources, you can control the chemical composition of the grown material. Here is the schematic of the layers of the two heterostructures. For sample one, the in gas layers have different indium mole fractions, which are tailored to achieve a band gap suitable for photo excitation at 1550 nanometer wavelength. The second sample's design is mostly to achieve stability, so the functional indium arsenide layers don't disintegrate. Here are the results of the terahertz time domain spectroscopy analysis of the samples. The emission of bulk indium arsenide, a well-known terahertz emitter, 
was added for comparison. We find that the ingaas on indium phosphide produced a higher peak-to-peak -peak value, about 35% greater than that of the indium arsenide on gallium antimonide. Although, the bulk in the indium arsenides still has the greatest uh, terror emission. We attribute the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the indium gallium arsenide sample to the large penetration depth, which leads to more photo excitation and hence increased terahertz emission. On the other hand, photon energy of the 1550 nanometer laser limits the emission of terahertz radiation for the second sample. Other factors that can affect the terahertz emission are the mechanical strain in the samples, difference in resistivity, and uh, presence of carrier traps which can be affected by post-processing techniques such as the annealing process. The Fourier transforms of the spectra show a 2 picosecond pulse width for all samples. The noticeable dips on the plots correspond to water vapor absorption lines. Although both samples terahertz emissions are less intense compared to the bulk indium arsenide, the presence of these water vapor absorption dips can suggest that the emitted terahertz radiation using the 1550 nanometer excitation wavelength can be used for spectroscopic fingerprinting within its usable uh, frequency bandwidth. To summarize, uh, two samples, the indium gallium arsenide on indium phosphide and indium arsenide on gallium antimonide fields were grown using molecular beam epitaxy. Although both samples' terahertz emissions are less intense compared to that of the bulk indium arsenide, the emitted terahertz radiation using the 1550 nanometer excitation wavelength can be used for spectroscopic fingerprinting within its usable band frequency uh, as seen from the detection of the water vapor absorption lines. That's everything for this talk. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Good afternoon. One way to transmit radio waves at great distances is by letting it bounce back and forth through the ionosphere. In this region, ultraviolet light from the sun collides with atoms, knocking the electrons loose. This then creates ions or atoms with missing electrons, which cause the reflection and absorption of radio waves in this layer. The simplest model to describe the ionosphere is called the Appleton model. Named after the 1947 Nobel Prize for Physics laureate, E.V. Appleton. In this model, we treat the ionosphere as a collection of electrons and ions, or plasma, moving in a uniform magnetic field. The dispersion relation calculated from this model is expressed as where omega p and omega c are the plasma frequency and precession frequency, respectively. From this, we then see that the ionosphere is birefringent. Plotting this expression with respect to the frequency, we then have this figure, wherein we consider two different ratios for the plasma and precession frequencies. The blue and red curves correspond to the positive and negative solutions from the previous equation, respectively. From the plot, we then see that the refractive index at some frequencies is complex. This then suggests that the ionosphere is a lossy surface. From the work of Hermosa, Nugrawati, Ayello, and Wordman, published in Optics Letters, Lossy surfaces exhibit dim shifts. This was then the motivation of our study entitled Invert Federal Shifts of Electromagnetic Waves Due to the Ionosphere. I am Nina Angelica Zambale from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Before we go to our results, we first ask the question what are beam shifts? Beam shifts or shifts are consequences of a real beam having a finite width. These are corrections to our well-known geometric laws, such as the law of reflection and Snell's law. Shifts that are perpendicular to the plane of incidence is what we call the invert Federov shifts. 
there exist two variants of this shift, namely the spatial and the angular shifts represented by delta IF and theta IF respectively. These expressions are actually dependent on the Fresnel coefficients RS and RP, which rely on the material interface, angle of incidence, polarization, and the frequency or wavelength of the beam. From our equation of the dispersion relation presented a while ago, we then substitute it to the Fresnel coefficients and then to the spatial IF shifts. In this study, we are only concerned with the spatial shifts since at long propagation distances, the electromagnetic wave can be assumed as a plane wave, thus the contribution of the angular or the theta IF vanishes. These are our calculated results. The figures show the spatial shifts for a 45 degree linearly polarized light and a right circularly polarized light in the case of omega p greater than omega c. The different colors correspond to varying incident frequency values. From the plot, we then see that the IF shifts are present in the whole angular spectrum for small frequency values for the linearly polarized light and at the all frequency values for the right circularly polarized light. This then suggests that the IF shifts can be used to characterize the ionosphere. We note here that the plasma frequency from our dispersion relation is related to the electron density, which is also dependent on the height of the layer. The precession frequency omega c, on the other hand, is a function of the magnetic field. Measuring the IF shifts then can give us the material properties of the ionosphere layer. Furthermore, we have also investigated the case where omega p is less than omega c. And we notice that at higher incident frequencies, there are blind spots or angles at which no shifts are detected. The blind spot threshold angle is actually related to the critical angle of the total internal reflection that happens from air to the ionosphere. At incident angles equal or greater than the critical angle, the IF shifts exist. Another notable observation would be the frequency independence of the shifts of the right circularly polarized beam. One disadvantage or advantage, depending on the application of this polarization state, is that the shifts overlap for all frequency ratios. One outlook of this result is that the detector can be positioned at one location only and still can receive the signal regardless of its frequency. As a summary, in this study, we have presented the spatial invert federal shifts due to ionosphere described by the Appleton model. We have also presented some possible outlooks for the calculated shifts. If you want to know more about our study, you can scan this QR code or go to tinyurl.com slash stp2020 2F05 to download our paper. Thank you and good afternoon. Today, I will be discussing our work, the 2018 Mount Mayon Eruption, a physicochemical characterization of inhalable ash particles collected in Legazpi City, Albay, Philippines. I am Mr. Miguel Antonio P. Catalig, the presenter for this oral presentation. For some background, there were a series of eruptions in the period of January to February 2018, two years ago. Of particular interest are the following, volcanic ash, PM10, and PM2.5. For volcanic ash, these are byproducts of the volcanic eruption. PM10 and PM2.5 are inhalable particulates with PM10 having sizes of less than 10 microns, while PM2.5 being finer have aerodynamic diameters of less than 2.5 microns. As we can see, 
finer particles can be deposited further in the lower respiratory tract system. In our study, the inhalable volcanic ash were characterized by three ways. One is via mass concentration, two by size distribution, and three by elemental composition. Our sampling site for our study is the Gogon Central School, located in Legaspi City, Albay. This is located southeast of the crater of Mount Mayon. Our sampling date was taken on the 8th of February, 2018. For our sample collection, we use a cascade impactor connected to an air pump with a flow rate of 2 liters per minute. So as air is being collected by our, by our air pump, it then passes through this cascade impactor and it's filtered through multiple layers. So in the topmost layer, you have your coarsest particles being filtered out. And then at the lower layers, you have your finer particles filtered out. So here is the disaggregated form of our cascade impactor. You have this as the coarsest layer and you have here as here your finer, finest layer. So the cascade impactor system is then placed in the field at a height of around 1.5 meters to mimic uh, the location of the human nose, uh, which is approximately for a Filipino around 1.5 meters. One way to characterize collected air samples is via its mass concentration. So we use a meter to let the microbalance to do this. So first we have blank filter papers and then we weighed it. So, so the measurement is labeled as MB. And then the, the samples with collected uh, the air particulates were then again measured. So this is MA. And then the difference would be the measure of the mass of the particulate collected. So in order to measure its concentration, we need to uh, divide it by the volume of all the air that is presumed to have been collected via the air pump. So we use this value of 420 minutes since the data collection took place on February 8, 2018 uh, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So this ref represents seven hours of measurements. And with the flow rate of 2 liters per minute, we're now able to calculate the particulate matter concentration. For size distribution and elemental composition, 900 particle images were analyzed for size distribution. And that particular 900 particles were also then processed using EDX for elemental composition. In order to determine the percentage of the elemental composition, their average were then later on taken. As you can see in this graph, the mass concentration for the finer particle, which is PM2.5, uh, the limit has been exceeded. So the 25 microgram limit has been exceeded for our finer particles. So this means that uh, the impact of our finer particles is clearly seen in the collected air samples. So in this particular uh, case, also we note of the prevailing uh, winds during the data collection, which is towards the southwest. Gogon Central School is located to the southeast of the Mount Mayon Crater. So based on this, we can see that it's more likely that finer particles are being collected uh, in comparison to other locations around Mount Mayon. For our size distribution, we can see that the bulk of the particles collected are in the finer region. Uh, this is the 2.5 uh, micron mark. So most of the particles collected are PM 2.5. And the distribution of our PM 10 particles is seen here. So significantly, most of the particles collected are in the PM2.5 region. So the maximum particle count are on the range of 0.5 to 1 microns. Health-wise, these are the range of particle size that are more likely to be deposited in the lower respiratory tract, so deeper into our lungs and into our alveoli. The slide here shows the detected elements and their expected 
respective concentration and the figure in the right shows an, an image of a particle scanned using SEM EDX. On the detected elements, it may have come from two modes, one via interaction with gases in the volcanic eruption, such as your hydrogen sulfide, HF, HCl, CO, and CH4 for our volatile fraction, and for aerosol fraction which might have come from uh, magma, and the wall rocks from our volcanoes. So it can be seen collect in our collected uh, particulates via uh, the presence of volcanic glass such as plagioclase and pyroxene or the existence of trace metal in ashes. To summarize, our results show that for PM10, it's below the limits in WHO. However, significantly, collected ash is fi very fine and above the limits of WHO for PM2.5. So there's a higher proportion of finer particles collected. Most particles in the, are in the 0.5 to 1 micron range, which is uh, the size that can penetrate our lungs and our alveoli. Far location and prevailing winds resulted in collection of finer ash in Gogon Central School and detected elements could have been associated with volatile gases, magma, and wall rocks of our volcano. We would like to acknowledge the Nuclear and Analytical Techniques Application Section of PNRI for the use of their gravimetric analysis instrument. We would also like to thank the administration and staff of Gogon Central School in Legazpi City and the Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council of, Al of Albay for their guidance and cooperation.